Okay. Thanks everyone for coming today. This is our panel, eBPF for observability, data overload, panacea or pain. And the key question that we're gonna be trying to understand here by the end of the panel, is eBPF finally the panacea to observability problems or will it just be another deluge of unhelpful data only to bring pain to our already overloaded observability teams? So with that, let's get started. Uh, we have a great set of panelists here. And the first question, I'd like you uh, each to introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about how you're using eBPF for observability in your project. All right, cool. So I'm Frederick. Um, I founded a company called Polar Signals, and we do uh, profiling using eBPF. Um, in case people are maybe not familiar, profiling kind of allows you to see um, where resources are being spent in your code down to, your, down to the line number in your source code. And the way that our profiler works, or that generally any sampling profiler works, is um, based on like a CPU overflow basis. So every X amount of CPU cycles, our eBPF program gets run. And the way our eBPF program works is that it figures out what is the current function call stack and saves that. And then we can build statistics using that to say if we see the same function call stack multiple times, we can say statistically speaking, that's where that amount of time was being spent. And so that's the product. And um, we have an open source project as well called Parca, P-A-R-C-A, that you, know, you, can, you can go ahead and try out immediately. It has an awesome Kubernetes integration. Uh, hi, I'm Anna. I work at Isovalent, a company that is known mostly from a now graduated project, uh, Cilium, which uses eBPF for networking. I work at Isovalent uh, on the observability side uh, on a few projects. Uh, first of all, Hubble, which is uh, observability layer for Cilium, which doesn't use eBPF directly, but sort of piggybacks on what Cilium does and uh, processes that networking data. Uh, and second project is Tetragon, which is a security observability project uh, using eBPF mostly in security context to give uh, security teams visibility into what's going on and also to, um, to provide enforcement. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Shahar. I'm uh, the co-founder and CEO of GroundCover. Uh, GroundCover is basically building a full observability stack on top of eBPF which basically means that we provide application metrics, application tracing, uh, troubleshooting on top of a platform by correlating metrics, log, traces, basically anything you can expect from a full APM or application performance monitoring solution by using a sensor which is mostly built on, on top of eBPF. Uh, so the end result is like, for an environment like, like Kubernetes, uh, within the installation of one eBPF sensor basically by uh, setting that eBPF program to run and aggregate the data correctly in a Kubernetes cluster, we can get a full stack observability from uh, infrastructure to application within practically like a minute or two without any code instrumentation or hard work from the R&D. Hello, I'm, I'm Laurent, I, I work at Datadog. Uh, I'm filling in today for Val who couldn't make it. Uh, so Datadog is an observability company and we've been enhancing Datadog recently using eBPF. We currently use it for a few use cases. The, the key main ones are instrumenting the networking stack and to do network performance analysis, but also service monitoring. And we also use uh, eBPF to, to get security signals, so interesting security events happening on nodes. Okay, great. That's a nice introduction. So why did you choose to use eBPF and what other options did you consider? So Laurent, do you wanna First, sure. Um, so when we initially started, we wanted to provide network performance monitoring. So looking at what was happening uh, at the TCP layer of, of, of the stack. And at the time we were looking at options, right? Looking at procfs, doing something like leap pcap, so capturing packets and, and analyzing them. But of course, as you can imagine, the cost of these solutions was was pretty high and, and so we very quickly settled to eBPF. It was a while back and it was uh, much harder back then, but we'll be uh, discussing this uh, later, I'm sure. 
Um, at, at ground cover, the, I think the situation for like a uh, full observability platform, the, the alternative is very clear. It's, uh, it's an SDK instrumentation inside your code that basically alongside some agent that collects metrics and logs can actually capture what the application is doing. Uh, so in ground cover, one of the things we do is we aggregate the data, process it, and store it completely differently. So at the beginning of the company a few years back, uh, we did consider using an SDK solution, but part of the pain in the industry that we feel right now is that uh, we see it in open telemetry and in other uh, vendor-based SDKs. Working that SDK into your code, specifically in uh, modern languages like Golang, is even kind of deteriorating. The auto instrumentation is becoming more and more painful and less automated. And eventually, eBPF for us is kind of solving that problem of providing an onboarding into a full data experience of what's going on in the application without uh, doing all that hard work. So the alternative, I think, is part of the pains we're trying to solve at the moment. Uh, so for us at, uh, at Isovalent, we use eBPF for lots of things. So um, it, it wasn't uh, a big barrier for us to, to use it also for observability. In Tetragon project, we uh, did initially try another, other solutions, like uh, we tried polling from user space data exposed by, by the kernel. Um, Tetragon project is, uh, is intended to be used mostly by, by security teams. And one thing that uh, we get from using EPF is that we are not missing any events. Security teams in general are, don't want to hear that you are missing some data. They want to have everything for audit purposes uh, if you have security incident, then of course, missing any data would be very, very bad. With eBPF, it's easier for us to achieve that complete visibility. And also, we, um, we are achieving a greater performance. So uh, the overhead uh, of getting this visibility is much lower than with other solutions. So uh, even though we initially started um, writing some code in, in user space and polling uh, Linux kernel for, for data, we uh, gradually started then moving uh, more and more code to VPF to achieve full visibility and performance. So I actually love this question because um, when I started the company, we actually didn't want to concern ourselves with collection of data at all because we came from the Go community where profilers are pretty awesome. Um, and then we kind of started to play around, you know, in other ecosystems and, you know, the situation was pretty bleak. Um, and <clears throat> it just turned out that eBPF was kind of a perfect fit um, for collecting this kind of data because it kind of allows us to operate at a super low level. Um, and then ultimately, you know, also all these awesome benefits of being able to do zero instrumentation. You don't have to change your code at all. Um, you don't have to change your deployments at all. Um, and when you look at the kind of profiler ecosystem, something that keeps happening is that for all these languages, profilers keep re being rewritten and all of the same problems keep being resolved all the time in every single language, right? So like, let me give, a, give an example. Like there's a really popular profiler in the Python ecosystem called PySpy um, and they have to re-implement like um, the unwinding of native stack. So when you call out to libcuda or PyTorch or whatever, um, and this stuff is very, very complicated. And because we're able to build all of this as a whole system profiler that profiles your entire system in the same way, we're able to kind of reuse these pieces from uh, different languages and kind of cobble together um, really awesome profilers that fundamentally does some things that weren't even possible before. So we can do stuff like, we have, actually have a customer that embeds the Python interpreter into their Go process and then ends up calling libcuda, right? Like there's no, no other profiler in the world that could do stuff like that. Um, and only because we ended up kind of starting from scratch and being able to operate at such a low level are we able to basically deal with any situation that's thrown at us. Great. So now that we know a little bit about why you chose eBPF, how has your use of eBPF evolved over time? And what are some of the key milestones uh, of its development within the observability domain? Do I start again? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> something I think um, that's also kind of a pretty big misconception, I guess, is that um, 
eBPF automatically means you support all languages. Um, I, I don't really know why this started and where this ca came from, but it's like completely not true. <laughs> um, so like going back to this like Python example, so for native code, all of this is relatively speaking pretty easy. Like because um, the operating system has a stack and we just need to walk the stack and we figure out what the function call stack is. So all of that is kind of easy um, in languages like Go. But um, when we talk about Python, you know, all we would see in that kind of example is the C code that makes up uh, the Python interpreters. That, that's not very useful for most people writing Python code, right? And so um, just recently we, we actually released um, Python support and it's very intricate because we need to read memory from the Python virtual machine to figure out what is the f current function call stack as in the world view of the Python interpreter, right? And so um, what going through this evolution of, you know, at first we only supported Go, then we supported other native languages like Rust, C++, um, and so on, and now we're kind of moving up to higher, higher level languages. Uh, so I think that's kind of how our usage has um, kind of evolved broadening our language support. And I think the need for language support is ultimately what, what was the cause for that. Um, how our usage of UBPF evolves, right? That was the question. Um, I think the, the, the main thing is we started moving more and more of our code into EBPF, into kernel. Uh, so for a lot of things, uh, how, um, how we developed our projects was that we first um, developed some parsers, for example, in the user space, uh, or started collecting data from kernel in user space, um, proved that it's useful for, for our customers, and then gradually um, moved that uh, code into EBPF for greater performance and greater reliability. Uh, yeah, I think this is this is the main thing. Uh, I mean, I, th I think for us, the, it's kind of the scope of what happens what happened to eBPF for the last few years, rather than just ground cover. I think that as as a company using eBPF for observability, one of the things that uh, we want to do is do a lot of data crunching and move a lot of data from the kernel space to the user space. For example, in ground cover, one of the things that we believe in which I think is kind of missing in some, in some other uh, platforms, even like OpenTelemetry, is that uh, the payload of a request or, or an API that failed is very critical for troubleshooting. If you have that, that's like gold. But eventually, when you don't do data crunching in a sophisticated way outside of the application, moving all this data from, even from the user space inside of an SDK, that's, that's a lot of data and a lot of CPU basically running and doing all this uh, uh, implementation inside the SDK, and then when you do that, you kind of make the assumption of I don't want to process too much, I don't want, I don't want to disturb the application. So suddenly with eBPF, as time passes, improvements in the ring buffer, improvements in the verifier that allows us to create much more complex programs in the kernel, crunching the data and the, and the payloads of the traces already in the kernel, and moving stuff away from the kernel like payloads into the user space with very low memory and CPU footprint, that's dramatic for observability. And I think another thing that happens is, is Kubernetes. I mean, eventually, eBPF got, got sophisticated more and more over the past few years into the point that right now we can write uh, sensors that can even implement APM. But if you go over to a customer and they're running kernel version, I don't know, 3 point something, then what does it matter, right? So in a sense, Combining that with Kubernetes of uh, managed Kubernetes vendors pushing new eBPF versions, new, new kernel versions, basically to their to their images, uh, you basically have, everyone has that. It, it became commodities, so we can push the latest capabilities of APM into eBPF, and it's available for anyone using EKS, AKS, or whatever. That's one of the major pluses I think that happened. On our side, you, you, you mentioned the evolution. So we started small, like with a simple network performance monitoring product, and we've added features to this product, and we built more and more product, right? So we built service monitoring on top of this, and then instrumented security events. Now we're doing dynamics instrumentation, and I'm pretty sure that down the road, we're going to instrument more and more using eBPF because it's, it's so powerful. 
You, you also asked about milestones. I think for us, of course, everything related to how fast the community has evolved uh, has, been, has been great for us. I mean, the creation of the foundation, for instance, and the fact that the ecosystem is, is much uh, easier to work with now. Uh, I mean, you mentioned different kernels. I mean, one of the big moments for us was the availability of Cori, so compile once, run everywhere. It was a very big change like, compa compared to alternatives such as offset guessing or dynamic compilation. It was really great for us to be able to, 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 to deploy code that would, be, that would work on, on, on most kernels. So we've touched on this a little bit in your answers so far, but let me ask it more concretely. What are the key advantages of using eBPF for observability? I'd say the ability to instrument, I mean, we, we, we've, we've talked about it already, right? It's the ability to instrument pretty much anything happening in the kernel and in in user space too, with a very uh, limited uh, performance impact on the, on the node. And I think this is the, the key thing, right? Because alternatives in the past were either um, instrumenting in ways that were much more intrusive or developing a kernel module, which of course was much, much harder to do in terms of deployment and, and, and life cycle. And I think that's the key thing, like uh, easiness to, to instrument pretty much anything and, and, and low impact in terms of, of performance. Um, I think that one, one of the key points uh, is, is, of course, as mentioned, instrumentation. But I look at that from uh, an organizational perspective even more than a technical perspective. Because eventually, when you look at one person, one language, one platform, I mean, there's, there's a documentation, you will, you will get it to work. But eventually, we meet uh, companies. I mean, the, according to a Kong survey, the average company has a 180 microservices. So, and we, we kind of democratize uh, tech stack choices, right? The data science team will choose their stack. The, the backend team will choose their stack. So when you, you, when you get to a real organization working, say, in Kubernetes and using all these languages, uh, working through that instrumentation suddenly becomes an organizational problem. You get to have multiple stakeholders from the R&D, lots of people involved in this onboarding, and then onboarding to an open telemetry suddenly becomes like a few months of work uh, if you can get the engagement from the team to do that. So I think eBPF suddenly solved that, that organizational problem of, of it just works. One person can install it on the infrastructure and solve that problem. And, and the other is, uh, is basically resources. I think that one of the deficiencies of using an SDK is that eventually it's a piece of code running in your application. And the only way to measure the impact in response time, in CPU, uh, in, in basically resource consumption is A-B testing. You have to take it out, rip it out, and rip it and put it back in. And in a world of containers where we set limits on resources, right, and try to project how, peop how things are going to uh, behave, that's weird. I'm, I'm going to instrument an SDK that I don't know how it behaves, and now I have to set new resource expectations to my application and even uh, estimate response time. So running out of band from the application makes us the, gives us the ability to do more complex stuff and uh, not endanger the response time or the, basically the SLOs of the application, which is the most important thing. Um, so for us, um, low overhead is the, the first obvious uh, advantage and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, not missing any events. So when we were collecting events um, from kernel, from user space, it happens from time to time that the buffer, there are some buffers in, in between kernel and, and user space, the buffer um, is full and then we are missing events. We were, our customers were running into that over and over. and. Security people are unhappy with that. With EVPF, we can aggregate events in a kernel, and that way we can prevent um, users on missing on any critical events. And uh, another thing, uh, it's that EVPF, uh, EVPF-based observability is very hands-off for users. When you install basically an, some sort of agent that um, hooks eBPF programs in the kernel, and then it's all hands off. Uh, eBPF programs are collecting data, the agent is um, collecting data from the kernel and exposing it somehow um, to users, but this is it. Um, great thing uh, about this is uh, reliability of, of such solutions. Um, the VPF programs are checked by the verifier, and the verifier exists to make sure that the kernel doesn't crash. But because the programs are verified that they are safe to run, they also they don't crash 
Uh, so we are not missing any information because there was a bug in the agent. The program crashed because it ran out of memory, things like that. Things like that happen with a uh, user space solution that you are suddenly are debugging something and you suddenly realize that well, the agent crashed uh, and stopped collecting data and you can't debug uh, because you don't have this data. With BPF, it just doesn't happen. This, once these programs are hooked into the kernel, they just stay there, they are running there, and yeah, it's great for reliability of the observability pipeline. Yeah, I think almost everything has uh, kind of already been said. I want to connect to one thing that was kind of about the organizational um, aspect of it. Um, so, I, we see exactly the same thing that like zero instrumentation allows us to do this and that combined with wide language support is super powerful because most companies that we go into, you know, they use four, five, six different languages and not having to go through each um, uh, engineering team and having to change code and roll out and stuff like that just um, makes the like turnaround time so much faster. So completely agree with that. Um, the second one, I'm going to contradict myself a little bit um, from my earlier statement. Um, it's the wide language support, right? Like I did say it's very, very hard, but at the same time, if we had to keep doing uh, all this re-implementing in all these different languages, actually it turns out that would be way more work uh, to do combined with then rolling it out and everything, right? Um, that, you know, actually putting all of this work in into this once is way more worth it. Um, and then the last thing is for us actually it's also a security um, thing where in profiling typically how other profilers work is like Linux Perf, for example, um, it kind of works the same way, except it captures the entire stack and copies it to user space, which means in the absolute worst case, you've just copied a private key out of you know kernel space into user space, which is just horrendous for, from a security perspective, right? Because we can do all this unwinding that perf happens to do in user space, we can do all of this in kernel. It's actually also from a security perspective way better. And a lot of companies actually choose us specifically for this reason. So this panel so far has been very sunshine and rainbows, <laughs> but I'd like to hear a little bit of controversy now. So. What are the potential challenges and limitations that you've run into so far using eBPF for observability? Um, I guess everything from like being limited in memory, being limited in instructions, um, you know, unrolling loops. Actually, some of it is also a little bit positive because it makes sure that you kind of think about your limitations a little bit, but it's definitely very tough uh, to, to get right. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I guess challenges and limitations are, uh, well, for us, it's all related to how BPF itself in, in the kernel was, was evolving. So, uh, just a few years ago, um, BPF was really, hard to, to use for, for, for many of our use cases uh, because, uh, well, the, the complexity of the programs we could write was very limited. It is still limited, but uh, these limitations get lifted. They got um, limitations on the instructions, etc. got um, increased in recent kernels, and as users are adopting recent kernels, we also can write more complex programs. Uh, also, a VPF verifier is uh, got much more sophisticated, and it's still getting developed. So, um, the verifier is allowing more and more complex programs. So, um, yeah, this, um, these uh, limitations are lifted, but still, it, uh, this, this is, I guess, the, mes the main challenge for us: this complexity. And also, while writing some of the VPF programs, for example, um, layer seven parsers. <laughs> Uh, we we are finding kernel bugs sometimes. It it happens too, and uh, this uh, while eBPF program writing eBPF programs is not like full on kernel programming 
it has much shorter feedback loop. We are not waiting years and years until people are able to adopt it. Uh, it still has some signs of this code is running in the kernel. Sometimes we are just running into a kernel back and it has to be fixed. Backported users need to adopt new kernel. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, was, I was just going to say the like debugging is just, it's pretty awful when you have like a bad bug in like from like one customer or something. It's really hard to debug this stuff correctly. Um, and yeah, like we've, we've had the case where, you know, we locked up kernels before um, and we're working with like um, the kernel development team to make sure you know that these things get fixed and then we work with all the like distro providers to make sure that these fixes quickly make it into the latest patch releases and like we have by now we have connections in with like canonical with SUSE, with um, AWS with everyone to make sure that this stuff has quick enough turnaround but like it's is very painful when you when we run into stuff like this. Uh, I mean, I totally agree about the complexity. I think that eBPF uh, is open source or there's an illusion that it's ready to go, like for everyone. So uh, everyone can just take it off the shelf, you know, write a few ad hoc uh, commands and suddenly they can monitor whatever is going on in the production. But the, the reality is that uh, uh, the other part of the community, which is basically the frameworks and the applications themselves, is, in yet, is not yet ready for that. So. Just as an example, to, to do what we do and kind of monitor and, tr and tracing, like deep tracing of what applications are actually sending, you know, some of the stuff are easy to, easier to do from an eBPF perspective of just sitting on a network call or, or basically just, uh, you know, catching a DNS that passes through the through a network stack. That's easy. But what happens when you're starting to look at uh, context contextual stuff like gRPC? And you want to look into uh, SSL encrypted connections. I mean, the user doesn't care that uh, he just used uh, OpenSSL to just move stuff between the different microservices. He should see that, right? Because he's using to instrumenting uh, the application. So the application is before encryption. So there's a lot of challenges eventually of supporting all that from such a low level tier. In some cases, it's easier. In some cases, it's much more complex. So you get into languages like uh, Node.js and Java and stuff like that, and suddenly you have to uh, create and kind of be onboarded into all of these contexts of these virtual machi machines and kind of uh, uh, so you can understand what protocols are passing and what's going on and kind of build that entire thread for, for people. I think that over time, uh, as frameworks kind of expose the right hooks to the right places, it will start to converge into somewhere where it's easier to kind of uh, uh, hook on to a gRPC call and see what's going on just because uh, the framework is more compatible to that at some point. Um, but it will take time and currently it's, uh, it does require expertise. So that's what I, that's what I would say. I, I, I won't add much about the complexity and, and the verifier issues because of course this is one of the things we've, we've observed also. It's, it's easier uh, to get started with BPF but it's still pretty involved uh, at, at the beginning. Um, something I wanted to mention is on our, on our side, what we find the, the most painful is the fact that we want to support multiple kernels and multiple distributions. And while things are getting better, and I was mentioning Corey before, um, it's, it's still pretty tough, right? And even when you have like new features in the BPF that are extremely attractive because they allow you to simplify the code and be more performance and like, okay, I want to use this, but also have to have a fallback for all the kernels which means testing your code to make sure that they work in a performant way in multiple uh, distribution and kernels start to be uh, trickier and trickier. Um, something I, I wanted to mention too is we mentioned the low overhead of eBPF and, and that's definitely true and that's great, but there is still overhead, right? And, and sometimes if you hook on a very hot function in the data pass, the impact you're going to get on the node can be significant. And it's something we've seen instrumenting some network calls in very heavy loaded nodes, for instance, and something to be, to be careful about. And another thing I think that will be important down the road is the security implication of uh, running eBPF, because if you want to load an eBPF program, you need very high privileges, right? And if you just want observability, you might not want to give a, a tool the ability to load any program, any kind of eBPF program on any hook point. And we, we believe that down the road, um, the granularity of permissions, eBPF permissions, are going to be, are going to be much, uh, much more fine-grained and, and much stronger because, of course, you, we probably don't want to have uh, cap eBPF or 
or CAPS is sending on a node for just observability. It feels like very high uh, privilege, right? So we've talked about some of the pros and cons of using eBPF for observability. If you're going to give advice to a platform team that wants to start implementing it, what considerations do you think they should take into account when integrating eBPF into the, their observability tool chain? I, I just continue what I, what I was saying. I think one of the first key things to do is to decide on the kernels you want to support, right? Like how far back do you want to go? Because this will define what, what you can do and what type of eBPF code you, you can write. And, and, and I quickly mentioned performance and security. I think it's a, these are also important things to, to keep in mind. I think one thing that uh, people need to consider is that it's not uh, magic. I mean, once you get that probe active and uh, data starts flowing, you have to put it somewhere. And I think the eBPF um, kind of tools out there are still in a situation where they're more ad hoc than uh, built to be used in like a real environment. So, okay, you got that working and now that just pouring out tons of data. Is it worthwhile? Do, do you want it to run in your kernel constantly? Do you, want, do you do something with this data? Where do you write it? How do you process it? I think that's kind of the, the next question. And when people start to mess with eBPF, I think one of the major uh, concerns, if you're not thinking it all the way through, is that it can be uh, sometimes much more data than you expect. Uh, if you don't know what, what exactly you want to get out of it and how exactly you want to process it, and if you do, some of that processing can happen in the kernel and that can, that can save you a lot of resources and pain. And if you don't, then you will eventually kind of have to pay for it in either resources or basically just data you need to store and figure out what to do with. Yeah, I can agree with everything that was said already. Kernel version is, is the main thing to, to consider. Uh, recently, we are uh, not really seeing kernel versions we cannot support very often. But uh, if you are a user with lots of legacy, lots of uh, old infrastructure, then um, this, is, this is a limitation. Uh, it's also a motivation to uh, upgrade uh, Linux kernel version, really. And um, while using eBPF for, for observability, um, for in some use cases, like uh, auto-instrumentation, um, eBPF gives you automatic visibility to uh, basic stuff. But for more, more advanced use cases, like what, what we are doing in Tetragon, we uh, designed Tetragon to be super flexible. Uh, with Tetragon, you can hook to any kernel function or any K-probe, any trace point, really, if you really want. Um, and this is the main challenge, that it's tempting um, to if you can get, have that visibility, it's tempting to just collect information about all file operations, for example. You can do that, sure. Uh, you will be overloaded with data super, super quickly. So uh, while using uh, eBPF for, for collecting uh, information from about what is going on in, in the kernel with um, enhancing it with, with some uh, Kubernetes context, for example, uh, I think platform teams need to think uh, a little bit more what they really need and um, yeah, really configure the tools to, to collect what they need, not everything. Yeah, I mean, of course, I agree with everything that's been said uh, so far, but I think, you know, saying something that probably a lot of people don't really want to hear is like, understand what it is that you're doing there, right? Um, because also everything that each of us are saying here, we typically you know, have our own bias because it comes from what we happen to work on. So for example, the performance overhead um, aspect you know, for our purpose is actually extremely well-defined and you know, it, we don't really ever run into that problem, being, that being a problem, because it's very configurable on the frequency that we happen to profile at, right? And so, it, yeah, you know, I know, Everybody just wants the magic wand um, to solve all the problems, but you know, I think there's something to it to actually understand what it is that you're doing, whether it's for data, the amount of data or the amount of privilege you're giving this stuff, um, you know, or security reasons. Unfortunately, it's still best to understand what you're doing. 
Okay, and to close out the panel, we have the lightning round. You each get 10 seconds. What is the future of eBPF for observability? <laughs> I mean, I, I guess, you know, we're, it's going to become extremely prevalent. Like, we, we see all of these different things happening, and I think, you know, um, individual instrumentation on an application level is just going to become less and less. Yeah, it's it's going to be everywhere, <laughs> I think. Uh, BPF itself will, start, will be easier to, to use. I, I hope to see more and more people really writing uh, BPF code um, because uh, it's, it's getting easier. The verifier is getting more sophisticated. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be everywhere. Uh, yeah, and I think that the DBPF is going to be completely prominent as kind of the data source of getting most of the data for observability. Uh, its closeness to the infrastructure will open up new use, case, new use cases with the cloud vendors. Suddenly, you're going to be served with an infrastructure kind of pre-ready for observability and get all this data without doing anything. So uh, it's definitely the future, and uh, most solutions you're going to be using will be moving to getting most of their data from it as, as far as I'm concerned. Yes, I mean, I agree with everything you said. I think it's definitely only the beginning of what we can do with, with EBPF, and we're only going to see more of it. It's going to be easier, and we're going to be able to do much more things with it, and so expect to see more of it. Great. Thank you for coming, and thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. If you guys have any questions, you can use the microphone in the middle. We only have time for a couple, though. Yeah. Um, so I heard a little bit of highlighting like some of the security implementation, uh, implement, implement, security issues with like every loader kind of having Cap UPF to do what it does today. Um, have you had any real world examples of that being a problem so far, or is it more of like in the future you see it as being? So we haven't really, like oftentimes it's more that like eBPF as a technology once needs to go through a security team or something like that. But the reality is after that, like with enterprise contracts and stuff, you basically have a line in there that says, you know, you're not going to do anything bad. Like that's, that's, you know, at the end of the day, how enterprise sales um, and contracts work. So not really a problem. Yeah. I, yeah. I, think, I think today the trade-off is given what we can do with eBPF, uh, it's obvious we're going to use it, despite the, the, security the potential security implications. However, I expect that in the future, uh, we'll have much more control in what we can do, like programs will be signed, the types of hook points you can, you can, you can hook to will be, will be limited, and this is just barely starting. Okay, and then one more quick question. In terms of debugability, is there a go-to solution for like a Kubernetes cluster today? Like, do all of your companies have their own debuggability stacks they use? Like, BPF tool containers that they run privileged to debug stuff on the node, or is there a shared solution that you all can use? I mean, we all work on pretty different things, so each of them are separate solutions. Yeah, because we got yeah. continuous profiling, security, APM, and yeah. Yeah, I guess at the moment, a lot of this tooling is still kernel development tooling, like debuggers that are used by kernel developers for us at least. Do you run into cases where you have to deploy or debug the like management of BPF on the node? So something that would be more generic across all your different systems. So maybe a pin isn't working correctly and the program gets cleaned up on reboot or stuff like that. Yeah, so, so we have um, some like um, developer tool which is uh, basically monitoring in a Kubernetes cluster what programs are running what BPF maps are loaded in the cluster, and it's integrated um, in, with like, other um, uh, Kubernetes tools like Kate Nines. So uh, cool. yeah, it's, it's visualizing this information in a similar way. We have something like that. Uh, it's like yeah, something hacked <laughs> just to help us a bit. Cool, thank you. Hi, uh, most of the pain points seem to be around usability and like developing for it. Uh, other than the security concern, are there any other conceptual issues that you can see in the long run or things that EBPF will have to 
adapt to or maybe harden? I think just from the, the from an accessibility perspective, people are basically using cloud, right? So, in a sense, it's not yet fully accessible to all the platforms you would be using. So, for example, Fargate and stuff like that. There are abstractions that would prevent you from using eBPF. So keep that in mind. So, in in a sense, it's feasible, but you can't do that, uh, or stuff like that. So, I, the community is solving all that, but currently, it's not always accessible. If the AWS um, PM for Fargate is in the, <laughs> in the room, we've all been uh, feeling this pain for the last two years. It's coming, right? <laughs> yes, that's what they've been saying for the last two years. <laughs>